Hello and good afternoon friends. Welcome once again to the CEC Edisette live lecture. Dear friends, uh, we are pleased to announce that uh, from today onwards, uh, we are going to start a very new series uh, and this series is on transmission genetics. Uh, we would be conducting numerous sessions on genetics right from the classical genetics to the uh, modern genetics. Uh, dear friends, in this session today, we are basically going to talk on Mendelism or you could say uh, we are going to talk on the history of the genetics and uh, for this we have again with us in our studios Dr. Eklavya Chauhan. Dr. Chauhan is an associate professor in Desh Bandhu College uh, in the Department of uh, Botany, uh, University of Delhi. So, first of all, I would like to welcome our uh, guest Dr. Eklavya Chauhan. Dr. Chauhan, welcome to the Edisit lecture and I hope that all the students who might be watching us right now uh, would be very excited because uh, this, this is a very, very interesting topic. Thank you very much, Geetika, for the kind words. Uh, let me remind you, uh, you fired a question at me on the last turn when we were departing on the last note on respiration. And uh, if I can quote, you asked me, what are you going to teach next? And I said, genetics. And then you had asked me, how would you introduce this particular topic? I am uh, going to take uh, on today exactly from where we left. And uh, I also said at the same time that uh, I would introduce genetics in a manner that we are like our parents yet different. So that means the science of genetics is uh, confined to this sentence only. When we say we are like our parents, that means like begets like. A dog is going to give birth to a puppy, a cat to a kitten a rose flower to a rose flower and a plant and obviously a human being to a human being. So that means there is something which defines the preciseness of transmission of characters from the parents to the offsprings. We have seen our parents, our grandparents and now we ourselves are parents swearing to our children, no, no, you are not a human being, you are the son of a so on and so forth. But do we really mean it? Do we, do we involve genetics in our discussion? Perhaps not. That's only a matter of anger. But then, like begets like. It stays yet. So this is what is called as heredity. The other part is variation. The question we ask ourselves, are we photocopies of our parents? Are we exact clones of our parents? Perhaps not. We may differ. Uh, with our parents as far as our intellect, our complexion, our uh, physiognomy and our external morphology or even our RQ is concerned. But then the fact is that we are not exact copies of our parents. How does it happen? We would see subsequently that there is a reshuffling of uh, genes. Now the word gene comes. So that means this is variation and the science of genes is nothing but genetics. The term genetics was introduced much, much later at the beginning of the 20th century by William Bateson and uh, we today are going to begin our uh, discourse from Mendelism because there can be no genetics without Mendel. Here was a person who was not a scientist, he was not a professor, he was not an academic person, above all he was a priest. And he laid down the foundations of genetics. 100 years after Mendel, we are still trying to find out how the seeds that he chose became wrinkled, what is the basis for having smooth seeds, and so on. So let's begin with some of the very early ideas that uh, were prevailing before Mendel uh, came into the scene of science. There have been many, many pre-Mendelian viewpoints. People, great scientists, mathematicians like Pythagoras, which was way back in 500 BC, gave a theory and all these theories one can really laugh at today. And they, it was a moist vapor theory. Now what does this theory say? It says that there are some types of moist vapors which are coming out from our body. They enter the body of the female from the male and this is how a child is formed. Uh, 
And Empedocles was another scientist who gave the fluid theory. He said that some sort of fluid comes from the male into a female to give rise to the new generation. The father of biology himself, none other than Aristotle, gave the famous reproductive blood theory, which means blood gives rise to different body parts. Now, these are some of the ideas, some of the decadent ideas which we even nurture today when we talk that we have a blood coming from this race or the other. We will talk about it in some other uh, um, aspect of genetics when we come to the genetics of blood groups. We will end up in saying that it is a case of multiple alleles and blood is blood. Marcello Melfigi himself, a great botanist, gave the theory of homonucleus. As you can see in the diagram, a sperm having the pictorial depiction of a young being, which means a miniature individual, which is present in the sperm and also in the egg. So, that means this type of a pre-formation theory that everything is, is pre-prepared, pre-formed and then only the next generation comes uh, does, not, uh, does not hold go, uh, good scientifically wholly. Although today you can say that the DNA or the genes that we have in a sperm are nothing but a blueprint of what is going to happen in future. Morpheritus also was a bit more scientific. He said that the different body parts produce minute particles or pan genes. This was the first concept which uh, was uh, a way uh, a little different from the earlier ones which said that okay, these are the pan genes but they are coming from all our different parts. The great scientist Charles Darwin gave his famous theory of pan genesis which suggested that every body cell produces a gemule or a pan gene. Mm -hmm. At least the word gene was used without uh, knowing its exact literal meaning. And the, it is this pan gene which passes into the gametes. Now, I would say uh, Darwin was partly right and partly wrong because uh, uh, it is not every body cell that produces the, the genes which are going to go to the next individual. So, uh, history had to wait for August Wiesmann, uh, the famous German naturalist who gave the germ plasm theory for the first time. It was distinguished that there is something called as somatoplasm which means all the cells other than the germ cells or the reproductive cells, they are not involved in uh, transmission of characters and it is the germ plasm. That means there must be something present in the nucleus, although the word nucleus was not there at that time, uh, it must be present in sperm. So, it is the germ plasm which is responsible for giving rise to the new generation. Whether it was Pythagoras till wise one, one thing was very clear, everybody had a notion and was a very definite notion that all the theories that we have seen so far, they believed in blending. Blending means what? The characters of the father, the characters of the mother, they will all get mixed up and the child or the new generation, whatsoever species it is, would be a combined effect or let us say a mixture of both the parents. In the modern context, we ask ourselves a question, is it true? Certainly not. The character remains distinct. This is what Mendel concluded at the end when he talked about the famous postulate of the purity of gametes. It will come a bit later and uh, this is how the foundations came into existence. So, that means to summarize, whether it was the pan genes concept or the germ plasm theory. Germ plasm theory is, is uh, partly correct, although very sketchy, which says that it is the germ plasm which goes into the next generation and it is responsible for, uh, for the next generation. So, that means uh, the pan genesis theory would uh, only talk about the, the, the body parts 
and uh, then there are, uh, some of these cells from the entire body, they are traveling into the reproductive cells of the male and female and when they combine, they, they give rise to the new generation. Although the germ plasm theory would mean that it is our germ cells, namely the sperms and the, and the ova which would be having the entire set of genetic information. Now, this entire set of genetic information in today's world, we will call it as a genomic complement. But then the term genome would come much, much later in the sequence of events of our discussion. If I was to just uh, summarize the early concepts, that means the concept of pangenesis, the concept of inheritance of acquired characters, if you remember from your school biology, the, the concept of, uh, of a bodybuilder giving, uh, giving birth to a son who is as strong as, as himself, perhaps uh, this was the old Lamarckian theory which got, dis, uh, d, uh, which got discarded long time back. Blending inheritance uh, no longer holds good. The correctness of these theories began from the germ plasm theory and then of course with the advent of the cell theory and uh, when we had the postulates of cell theory that cell is the basic unit of life and then a cell arises from pre-existing cells as a result of a specific type of cell division then the chromosome number uh, also may be constant or may be reduced to half at the time of gamete formation. So, all these were the fundamental discoveries which helped in uh, Mendelism and uh, helped in Mendel giving a more scientific theory. <coughs> uh, the name Gregor Johann Mendel, uh, it will be much, much later in the discussion that we would call him as the father of genetics. Uh, just imagine this gentleman being a priest in the monastery, you can see in the picture, this is a, a garden which is perhaps considered to be the Mecca for all botanists because it is this tiny patch of land where the garden peas were planted and the classical experiments of genetics which laid down the foundations of modern science, of modern genetics, they were performed here. And if you could see, uh, Mendel's uh, statue uh, is in the background. Mendel was born on the 22nd of July, 1822, at a place called, a very small village called Heinzendorf, which was then in Austria and as a result of several regional wars, now it is in the Czech Republic. Uh, from his childhood, he was, a, he was a brilliant student and he studied philosophy. His idea was never to be a scientist. In uh, 1843, perhaps in the age of uh, 21, he was ordained as, uh, as uh, a member of the Augustinian monastery of the St. Thomas in, 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 a, in a tiny uh, village of Brunn in Austria and he was given the name Gregor because everybody who joins a church is ordained by a, a, a specific name. In uh, between the years 1851 and 1853, since this child was uh, or a young man was a, was a brilliant student and he had shown his uh, exemplary uh, wit and grit for, for knowledge, he was sent to the University of Vienna to study physics and botany. The young man got exposed to anybody who was somebody at that time at the University of Vienna. He was exposed to the best minds in science at that time. And he got enthused by uh, certain professors who taught him statistics. It is a matter of common sense. Anybody who is good in statistics would certainly have an analytical mind and would score over others as far as the interpretation of some of these results is concerned and this is precisely what happened. When he came back uh, from his training uh, from the University of Vienna, there was uh, a post of a temporary teacher in the monastery for physics 
and Mendel back in 1854 taught students for the next 16 years. His biographer says that Mendel was a very clear, logical teacher and his teachings or his lectures were very well suited to the needs of the students. He could simplify the things. Now, how did he get into uh, the pea business or, or uh, working with garden peas? For so many years when he used to pass through the church every morning for prayers and every evening just to retire, he could see several bushes of plants showing some characters in one season and slightly different characters in the other. We would be passing through bushes all the time, but do we really see or observe? This is perhaps the basic difference between seeing and observing. He observed that there were variations. Sometimes the entire bed of flowers or the, or the natural bush was having purple flowers. Many of the plants were tall and in the very next season all of them growing all by themselves in nature showed white flowers. They were not so tall, they were short, their characteristics were different, their pods were having a different position, a different color. When he opened these pods, the seeds had different color and different texture. So he was so observant and he uh, just observed and thought to himself, was there a distinct pattern in nature or everything which was growing in nature was ad hoc and just all by itself randomized. In order to quest his knowledge, he started performing certain experiments. The easiest thing available to him were the mice because you know in a monastery there is a lot of ration and lot of uh, foodstuffs stored, so the mice have a gala day. And he caught certain mice and he started experimenting because mice are also very fast breeders. He also collected many plants of different types. His biography says that about 29 different species he collected and he started working on them. But at the end he found that a garden pea or Pisum sativum was a material which listened to him quite well. It was very, very good as an experimental material. And imagine from 1856 to 1863, he performed a series of hybridization experiments not having, all by himself, not having any prior scientific training whatsoever in terms of hybridization. And there was a very, very sketchy uh, literature available. We will discuss this a little later. Uh, uh, these experiments, we will talk in details about the procedure after some time. Uh, he performed his experiments very, very painstakingly and uh, with lot of patience for about seven years. He had uh, along with other like-minded people who were open to science and uh, wanted to blend religion with science. Uh, they had formed a society in, in the monastery and also in the, in the village of Brun, which was called as the natural history of Brun. So one fine morning in 1865, he gave a series of two lectures uh, in front of the audience and uh, these experiments uh, were a result, a cumulative result of the experiments that he had performed for the past seven years. Well, his results did not invoke any interest among the audience. Uh, they were hardly convinced and hardly excited over the fact that when a tall plant crosses with a dwarf plant, in the next generation when the seeds are collected, the seeds are sown, the plants are got, it is observed that all the plants are tall. So people said, so what? 
I mean, it didn't excite because it was hardly any uh, a, 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 uh, an observation which could uh, excite anybody. Anyway, Mendel said that uh, perhaps I should now address the scientific community uh, and let's see what their reaction would be. So, uh, this Natural History Society was also uh, publishing their own uh, journal, a, a periodical. And in 1866, he published a paper in German, uh, which uh, in German reads Versuche über Pflanzen hybriden, which means in English, experiments with plant hybrids. This was a 48 page paper and uh, this was published in the Proceedings of the Natural History Society of Bonn. You can imagine the year 1866. Why I stress on years? Because uh, in today's discussion, the calendar is very important. The, the time frame that we are talking about, Watson and Crick were not born, genes were not known, DNA was not known. So that means we are talking of an era where, where uh, it was a very, very early time. And uh, those classical botanists, they uh, got some of the papers. It is believed that 3000 copies of this paper were sent to different scientists all over the world. Half of them did not open the journal because when they saw the journal and the address, somebody called Gregor Johann Mendel, a priest from the monastery of Brunn, then perhaps half of them thought that it was a case of charity. The other half perhaps thought that it was a case of God's discourse. So, we will see this when we have time or the inclination or both, which perhaps never came. Some of them who opened this paper were not in a position to understand what this fellow meant. Why? This paper was so complicated, it was full of statistical analysis of averages, of standard deviations, of uh, errors uh, which were minimized and different types of equations. So, half of them did not uh, recognize uh, this as worthy. Of, of any excitement or comment. So, we would say that virtually the entire work of Mendel or this paper went absolutely unnoticed. There must be some reasons why such an important paper, the importance of course came much much later to be recognized, but then why? What were the reasons of uh, the uh, obscurity of such a uh, fundamental work? First thing which comes to our mind is that this was published in a journal which was absolutely obscure. It was coming from a village society. It was not linked to any academia, no professor involved, no peer uh, review. And Mendel himself by his credentials was neither a biologist by profession nor a member of any academic party, no mutual recognition among professors and therefore, this had to happen. The results were so statistical, too complicated, so incomprehensible to a common scientist or biologist of that time that uh, it did not invoke any interest. We could also say that by and large, this work was so much ahead of time that it required perhaps a little more maturity in the minds of the biologists to really understand and appreciate how uh, things were going. One should also not forget a very important happening or a mishap as far as Mendel was concerned. When this paper of Mendel was published, that was a time when the entire world was bedazzled and excited over the implications of the recently published masterpiece, The Origin of Species by none other than Charles Darwin. Everybody was thinking about the descent of man, the, the theory of evolution and the revolution it had created in the scientific minds. 
So when such a big cannon is making a roar, who is going to bother of a little trifle sound of a handmade pistol? This is exactly what happened. So uh, the, the paper went absolutely unnoticed. The biogra biographer of uh, Mendel also mentions a very, very interesting anecdote. Uh, his paper reached a scientist, a very, very uh, popular scientist of that time, a German, Karl von Nageli, who was at the University of Munich. Nageli was, if you remember, the students must remember that Nageli was the first person to have suggested that the cells might arise from pre-existing cells. And it was this idea which was taken by Rudolf Virchow when he made the dictum omnicellula is cellula. And one should not forget, it was Karl von Nageli who gave the term meristems. So he was a very, very big scientist of that time. But then, like every scientist, he had his own idiosyncrasies. When he opened the paper, this fellow was perhaps the only one who could recognize the merit of this paper. He fully understood what this paper meant, but then everything was going against Mendel. His age, his scientific background, and his present profession. All of them went negative. So, Karl von Nageli wrote a letter to Mendel, young man, your paper seems good, but then this is not how researches are made. You have based all your observations on a single plant. This is not the done thing in science. You have to try and get similar results in other plants. If you do not have any ideas, let me suggest a plant to you. And it was Karl von Nageli who suggested the material hawkweed, which is uh, botanically called Hiratium. Can you imagine? viewers, this plant is so difficult to work because today when we look back and see as a postmortem, we find Hiratium is full of deviations from Mendelism. It has so many linkages, so many random uh, transposable elements so that one could never get the expected results that Mendel got. Mendel was a simpleton. He was so enthused and overwhelmed at such, uh, such a good response by a person other than, none other than Karl von Nageli. He immediately started work on Hiratium and never could get the results which were there. Uh, so that means he was never able to reproduce the results that he got in Garden P. And as a result, uh, he got virtually disgusted. Because whenever he used to correspond with uh, Nageli, Nageli used to say Hiratium first or other material first. So uh, gradually Mendel started losing interest and sometimes he also had a shaken confidence but no normally he knew what he was doing and he was right. And in 1868 he was made the abbot of a monastery and therefore he had now an, uh, an ever increasing level of administrative duties and he virtually stopped his scientific research. He started having ill health and finally he died on 6th of January 1884, uh, suffering from a disease, a kidney disorder, uremia. What a waste of life of a scientist who, uh, or, or a self-made scientist who died in absolute obscurity. Uh, I wish to quote uh, an obituary which appeared uh, in uh, 1884, uh, which said in a local newspaper, it suggested, his death deprives the poor of a benefactor and mankind at large of a man of the noblest character, one who was a warm friend, a promoter of the natural sciences and an exemplary priest. Nowhere this mentions his scientific achievements. Mendel was, however, convinced. Uh, it is recorded in the archives that he uh, was uh, 
he mentioned many a times to his juniors and this is a remark which he made to one of his young, younger monk. He said, my scientific work has brought me a great deal of satisfaction and I am convinced that it will be appreciated before long by the whole world. Uh, it is believed that one of his diary which was found from his room after his death was absolutely spotlessly clean except for four words written in one of the corners which suggested my day will come. But then the question is how long did we have to wait for this? This brings us to the rediscovery of Mendelism. Mendel died in absolute obscurity. His grave is by, his, uh, by the side of his parents in Heisendorf in Brunn. It was in the year 1900, which is 16 years after Mendel's death, that three people, incidentally, all good things in life come with serendipity. So this is what happened. Hugo de Vries, the famous Dutchman who also has talked about mutations, we will uh, talk in details much later, Karl Korins and uh, Eric von Schermach. They were working independently on similar problems and they even reached similar conclusions. All of them got together, they corresponded with each other, being uh, Dutch, Austrian and German, they had a common language and uh, science has a common language even otherwise. So when they got together, they found that each other, they, they could complement each other and uh, there was a work which they had done, they thought was really pioneering and it would be nice if they could publish a paper together and uh, show the world what kind of a achievement they had made. Incidentally, they searched for uh, similar literature. There was a few sketchy literature, but then they just stumbled upon a dust filled 48 page paper by somebody called as Gregor Johann Mendel who had died 16 years earlier and the work had been published about 35 years earlier and they were absolutely stunned. This gentleman who, whose address was a priest in the monastery had worked in multitudes of details, perhaps a thousand times more accurately, perhaps a few more thousand times in details and the statistical analysis. These three people were magnanimous enough, they attributed the priority of discovery to Mendel himself and they put their entire work into the perspective of Mendel's work and Karl Korins was uh, given the responsibility to formulate the laws on the basis of Mendel's postulates. And these were published in a journal which is still coming from Germany by the name Flora in the year 1901 and it was entitled Mendel's Laws. I always ask my uh, students who gave Mendel's Laws and without even a nanosecond of, uh, of uh, breakage, they, they, there's no pause, they immediately say, what a foolish question, by Mendel, who else? But then the question is, it was not Mendel, poor chap died of, in obscurity, it was the rediscoverers of Mendelism who gave the entire credit to Mendel for his pioneering work, which was hitherto absolutely uh, hidden from the entire scientific community. And then only Mendel was recognized as father of genetics. And it was then that William Bateson gave the term genes, uh, 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 the term genetics, and Johansson the term gene, and many other things. Uh, that means 16 years after his death and 34 years after the publication of his results, we uh, recognize a person and adorn him as the father of genetics. There are so many examples of belated recognition. He could never see the fruit 
of his work, there is a very important mention in genetics about Lady Mendel. Lady Mendel is nowhere related to, uh, to Gregor Johann Mendel, but her story that is we are talking about a very, very famous scientist Barbara McClintock who received a Nobel Prize in 1983 and uh, the story of her achievement is also that of uh, related recognition. So therefore, she has been nicknamed as Lady Mendel. Many, many years to be precise 24 years before uh, transposons were discovered in bacteria, Barbara McClintock uh, had discovered in Zia maze what she called as jumping genes. If a term is ahead of time, it always causes an ire and this is what happened with the scientific community at that time. People were not prepared to realize or even understand or comprehend that genes could also change their position. They thought that genes are not frogs. How could they leap from one place to the other? And her work was absolutely unnoticed. It was only when the transposons were discovered in bacteria that one looked back and said, oh, this was 24 years back. It was Barbara McClintock who is the pioneer. By the time the poor lady was suffering from cancer, then she was awarded the Nobel Prize and unfortunately she died a few years later. So this is again a story of, of her belated recognition. <clears throat> Let us come back to Mendel. Do we mean to say that Mendel was the first person who dreamt of garden pea being the ideal material for genetical studies? Perhaps not. There were many people imagine way back even in 1763, exactly 100 years before Mendel, his work came and it was a famous scientist called Reuter. He had worked on the breeding experiments in Nicotiana, that is uh, uh, tobacco and Knight and Goss, they had already worked on garden pea. Why were they not successful? There would have been certain shortcoming. So that means basically it was the experimental strategy, it was the, the uh, experimental technique and the statistical mind which helped Mendel to score over all odds. The irony of the situation is that all the earlier scientists, they considered the whole organism as uh, a unit for studying the inheritance pattern. So, if you study all the characters of an organism, you are bound to get lost. How would you uh, study or at least trace the um, inheritance pattern of a character generation after generation? So, it was very, very difficult. And then Mendel's training in maths came very handy because this was by and large one of the biggest contributions to his success. He was very methodical, very systematic. He selected one trait at a time and followed meticulously the inheritance pattern. The traits that he chose were with very, very sharply contrasted characters. To give you an idea, he selected a tall plant and a short plant. Now, there is nothing in between. If he had selected, for example, our height, he would have been lost because we are not, uh, many of us are tall, the others are short some are dwarfs and most of us are average. So, there is no average that he took, he only took a set of two sharply contrasting characters. Then he maintained a statistical record of all the crosses that he made and the crosses which he did not make. He kept in bags all the seeds, labeled them absolutely properly so that the results could be reproduced. The third very important aspect was, which perhaps Goss and Knight did not do with Pisum sativum, that Mr. Mendel was absolutely fussy and finicky about the purity of characters. When he wanted to take two parents for crossing, he wanted to be sure that the two parents that he was selecting were pure for that character. For example, if he wanted 
a plant with purple flowers, then he bred them, inbred them generation after generation to ensure that till the time not even a single plant with flowers other than purple was got, then only he would take them as the parent and then he will call them as parent with a purple flower. So, this required time, this required patience and I think Mendel had both of them. He did not want to be a professor, he did not want to score points, he had all the time in the world to pursue what we call as quest for pure knowledge and this is where he scored. Then what other people his predecessors did not do? Mendel crossed and traced the pedigree of these plants up to four and five generations so that he was sure to find out as to what was the pattern of inheritance so that he could give a statistical or, or a, a postulate based on uh, his observations so that they, they, they would be minimum exceptions. Although we would see that um, nothing is without exceptions. We have a whole chapter coming up uh, with you uh, which would be deviations from mentalism because whatever Mendel thought at that time uh, would not be holding true universally for all the other organisms. Then Mendel also formulated on the basis of his experimental uh, data certain postulates. Uh, Mendel was a, uh, was a person of uh, religion and science. So, whatever did not suit him in terms of where there was no convincing explanation, he simply left that cross. There will be some instances which we would see now where he did not make that cross although he knew about those characters, but the, the crosses are not found in literature. Some of uh, his uh, results are still available in the form of archives at the, at the archives at the University of Vienna and many of them got lost in the bombardment of the Second World War. But then uh, whatever they are, they also give us an idea that yes, some of the crosses he did make, but he did not mention. And finally, fate favors the scientific mind. He was very, very lucky to have chosen garden pea. Above all, the seven characters that he chose, it is a matter of chance that in today's terminology, none of them are linked. A common person would assume that all these seven characters blend very well with the seven set of haploid chromosomes that Pisum sativum has, but it is not so. We will see shortly. So, that means his choice as we said the of Pisum sativum or, or garden pea was, was very lucky. There must be some advantages in garden pea and some of the advantages uh, we, we, we can enumerate. The First is that the pure varieties of garden pea can be got. This he understood because he had read the paper of Goss. The characters in garden pea are very, very sharply defined. As I mentioned a few moments ago, tall and dwarf means exactly tall and dwarf. If you are going to take our complexions into account, then we are dark, fair, very fair, very dark. So that means we have now uh, a series of shades. Now, this will not do for a normal Mendelian genetics. We require just two characters which are absolutely sharply defined. Garden pea is very easy to cultivate. It has a short life cycle, short in the sense that you can get one generation in one growing season, which is about six months. In today's world, six months seems to be a very long period because we are hard pressed for time. To give you an example, Drosophila will finish its life cycle in a few weeks and a bacterium can give you a generation in 20 minutes. So, taking this perspective into account, working for 5 generations or 6 generations say in 6 months really requires a lot of patience which Mendel had. The other advantage is that 
to be statistically sound. The number of replicates should be many and this is exactly what happens in garden P. There is a large number of seeds, so many replicates are there and this is definitely of advantage for statistical observations. The flowers are large, they are easy to manipulate and above all, you know, Pisum sativum belongs to uh, the uh, leguminosae and uh, this particular papillonaceous flower is cleistogamous. That means the flowers do not open and it is a bisexual flower and obviously since it is a cleistogamous and, and a bisexual flower it has to be autogamous. Autogamous means that it is self pollinated. So, you are sure that the pollen grains of this particular flower are going to fall on the stigma of the same flower. Mendel was very careful. The plants that he mentioned uh, uh, to be taken, he first covered them, covered them with paper bags. So, he wanted to be sure that no foreign pollen grain should enter and therefore, his results would be statistically sound. So, there will be a least chance of foreign pollen grains and what he performed was artificial cross pollination. We know that most of the hybrids are not fertile. For example, if you are going to cross a horse with a donkey, the mule will result and it would be hybrid. Hybrid by, by definition is, is impure and it would be uh, sterile. So, that means uh, all these points went in favor of Mendel. Mm, uh, just wittingly, we always ask a question in the class, what would have happened if Mendel would have worked on an elephant or on a horse instead of garden pea? The answer is equally witty. He would have seen only one generation of an elephant in his lifetime. Mendel would have died and the, the baby elephant would have been deposited in the zoo and the story would have finished. There would not have been any Mendelian laws. So, what you require is an organism which can reproduce so fast, so many generations can be given in a small time so that you can analyze the inheritance pattern. The seven characters which uh, Mendel uh, selected were pertaining to the pair of contrasting characters. He took for example, the seed shape. We are all familiar, we eat peas that most of these seeds they are round, but then there are pods which have wrinkled seeds. Imagine it has taken us more than a hundred years. Now, to give a convincing explanation why some of the pods have wrinkled seeds. And now, in modern genetics, we talk of, of certain genes which are, are uh, what is called as starch branching genes which are uh, abbreviated as SBEI. We will talk about this at the appropriate time. So, uh, then he also selected the seed color, green or yellow. The flower color, we know in garden pea, the flowers could be white or they could be purple. If you have seen carefully the, the pod shape, some of the pods are inflated and some of them are constricted. And, and we find in the market, the ones with constricted pods uh, are, are uh, sold for a lesser price. Then the pod color itself, it could be green, it could be yellow. And if you look very carefully at the pea plant itself, the position of the flower could be either terminal or it could be that is at the top or it could be in one of the axils of the branches. So, that means these two uh, the, uh, and finally, the stem length, the plant could either be tall or dwarf. Let me mention here, there is no third character. Do not confuse it with the characters that we possess in terms of our, our height, in terms of our skin color, in terms of our intelligence, they are all not sharply contrasted. They also have averages, right. So, that means these are a set of very, very sharply contrasting characters. Mendel's work today after nearly 60 years showed that the seven characters which he took actually reside on four chromosomes. What do we mean by this? Garden P has a chromosome number of 14, 
which means one set of chromosomes which is coming from the, the male parent is 7, which is the haploid set of chromosomes or the genomic number. And when we number these chromosomes, it is chromosome number 1, which has two characters and these two characters are uh, flower color and seed coat color. On chromosome number 4, we have uh, three genes which are located. The first gene is, uh, is uh, of the shape of the pod, the other is plant height, the one in the middle and the seed coat color. And then on chromosome number 5, we have pod color and chromosome number 7, we have seed shape. Now, let us be very, very clear. These characters which he took, Mendel has shown as we would see subsequently all the crosses. He has not reported a cross between these two. If you look at the chromosome very clearly, these two genes for two characters namely the pod shape and plant height, Mendel has not mentioned this cross at all. Looking back, we can be sure why he did not. If he had reported this cross, it would have never conformed to the expected results of 3 is to 1. The principle of segregation would have not come, the test cross ratios would have been different and we would see subsequently these two are so close together in terms of position that they would be called as linked genes. They would not be separated, their, their recombination frequency would be low and therefore the results would all be uh, different and it, they would not conform to the expectations which Mendel said for 3 is to 1. Mendel's methodology was unique. His experiments included four uh, essential ingredients, selection of the right material, hybridization. If we could see in the figure, uh, Mendel used some very, very simple procedures or surgical experiments. He did not have a, a sophisticated lab and uh, he only used a brush and a pair of scissors. These two primitive tools laid down the foundations of genetics. He took a purple flower, opened it in a plant and first he opened a white flower. He with the help of a pair of scissors, he surgically removed the anthers. Now this bisexual flower technically becomes a female because the male uh, sex organs are lost. This is called as emasculation. He technically this white flower becomes a female flower. He took a brush and took some of the pollen grains from the anthers of the purple flower and dusted them on, on the stigma of the white flower, closed the flower, put a paper bag and waited. Fertilization occurred, seeds were formed, seeds were sown, plants were got. He waited for the flowers to come in these plants and he found in the first filial generation all the plants without exception were having purple flowers. He was not sure whether this experiment would be true if he had taken a reverse situation. This is called that is when he swapped the parents or the sexes of the parents. He now took the purple flower as a female. As you can see, he emasculated the purple flower and he removed the pollen grains and used it as a female plant and uh, now he dusted the pollen grains from the white flower, he got similar results. So, he was very sure with that the reciprocal crosses of all the original crosses that he made should also give identical results. This methodology finally proved that his approach was absolutely correct and he kept a statistical record of all these crosses taking the character of say pot shape or plant height or the seed texture. Seed texture is, is one of the most uh, popular 
um, experiments that he made and we have chances for for justification of all his laws and then finally he formulated the laws so that means all these things they summed up to mendel's success yet his work was not appreciated and as as i told you in the uh, in the monotonous history that we talked that still his work was absolutely a masterpiece work i think we 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 can stop uh, here and then uh, take the scientific approach of mendel's actual results of his uh, mono hybrid and di hybrid crosses and the mathematical implications in terms of probability and we would also like to do some numericals and some misconceptions but before that on the next turn we have to start like a good mechanic we have to open up the entire machinery and know the entire uh, parts that means we have to first be familiar with the terminology of genetics what to use when to use a term gene when to use a term ll are they synonymous sometimes or they have to be distinguished we are sure what is a genotype what is a phenotype what is a phenocopy and once we are familiar with these terms then things would be easy to explain and to comprehend thank you thank you sir thank you so very much for giving us such a productive session as uh, dr chauhan himself said that we would be uh, doing lots of things we would be practically examining the things uh, we would be discussing on the experiments as well as the various terminologies used in the area of uh, uh, genetics as well as uh, as he said uh, that we would be uh, solving some uh, numericals yes. uh, so as to make it uh, easy for you to understand uh, genetics uh, i would like to thank dr chauhan once again for giving his precious time and dear friends if you have any queries or if you have uh, any uh, questions regarding this very topic uh, that is uh, genetics although we have covered the historical part today but still if you have any queries you can mail us at info.cc@nick.in so that the next time when dr chauhan visits our studio we love we would love to uh, solve your queries in the lecture itself it is our uh, sincere i would say it is our uh, sincere promise to you uh, thank you sir thank you so very much uh, once again thank and you so much it will be a pleasure to discuss the queries if there are any Why definitely not? and dear friends if you want to access this particular lecture you can access it with the help of the youtube as we daily say that we upload our lectures only for you so that it becomes easier for you to uh, uh, go through the lecture ample of times once again thank you thank you so very much thanks